I'm minister of the Northfield Church of Christ in Northfield, New Jersey, and these are the evening services for Sunday, October the 3rd. Uh, per usual, we will sing praises to the Lord, we will observe the Lord's Supper, and I will have a message for you that hopefully will be enlightening, uh, edifying, and that uh, through our worship we will glorify the Lord. And so if you do have your songbooks, and we are singing from Songs of Faith and Praise, uh, please turn them to hymn number 144. 144. <clears throat> Everybody ready? O oh, worship the King, all glorious above, and gratefully sing His wonderful love. Our shield and defender, the Ancient of Days, pavilioned in splendor and girded with praise. Thy bountiful care, what tongue can recite? It breathes through the air, it shines in the light. It streams from the hills, it descends to the plain, and sweetly distills in the dew and the rain. Frail children of dust and feeble as frail, in thee do we trust, nor find thee to fail. Thy mercies, how tender, how firm to the end, our Maker, Defender, Redeemer, and friend. Number 156. 156. Beautiful, beautiful, Jesus is beautiful, and Jesus makes beautiful things of my life. Carefully touching me, causing my eyes to see that Jesus makes beautiful things of my life. And before we observe the Lord's Supper, let's uh, sing number 705. 7.05 A common love for each other, common gift to the Savior, a common bond holding us to the Lord. A common strength when we're weary, common hope for tomorrow, a common joy in the truth of God's Word. 
We know that at the Passover feast, the night in which Jesus was betrayed, that he sat down and observed Passover. But what it actually became is what we uh, familiarly call the Last Supper. And as we gather about the Lord's table, we have come to call it not just the Lord's Supper, but we call it communion. As we uh, commune with the Lord based on uh, what Jesus did that uh, uh, fateful evening and what he did for us uh, in the giving of his life. And uh, I, just, uh, I just pray that uh, we'll all just uh, pause and uh, give, uh, just give a little bit of time uh, to think of uh, the great sacrifice that was made for us. You know, in the Old Testament, sacrifice was an important part. They sacrificed <coughs> animals. Uh, they used uh, uh, vegetable type of grain offerings. And uh, these were very, very important. Uh, this was a very, very important part of the worship service. But the days of sacrifice would be over because Jesus made the ultimate sacrifice for each one of us. And so as we gather about the table, I'd like us to think of the sacrifice that was made on our behalf, that Jesus gave up his life that we might live, that he gave up his body, he gave, he shed his blood, that uh, uh, the, uh, a new covenant could be ushered in, the covenant of the New Testament. And I just pray that uh, we'll in all solemnity think that uh, they've been doing this as, from the day one of the church, that they gathered together on the first day of the week to break bread. And so uh, let's give thanks first uh, for the bread. Our Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that uh, this was a part of your glorious and wondrous plan. We're so grateful that Jesus came to earth. We're so grateful that he taught uh, only the way he could teach, that uh, he did miracles that only he could do. And uh, ultimately, uh, he sacrificed himself one time and for all, that he gave up his body, that his body was hung on a cross. And so as we partake of this bread, I just pray that we will remember the body, that we will remember what he gave up physically so that uh, we could uh, have redemption. I pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. And after the bread, uh, Jesus took the fruit of the vine and uh, he explained to his disciples that this was uh, his blood, that this was uh, symbolic of the new covenant, the, the shed blood, the, the life-giving substance that allows human beings to live. And Jesus gave his blood up and very, very specifically, we know that it is the blood that washes away our sins. So as we gather about the table and we think of his body, let's also think of the blood that he innocently shed, that our sins might be washed away. And realize, as the hymn says, uh, there is indeed power in the blood. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we partake of this fruit of the vine, we just hearken back to Calvary and 2,000 years ago. And we think of what uh, Jesus, our Savior, gave up for each one of us, that he allowed his blood to be shed. And uh, most importantly, dear Heavenly Father, we realize that that is the blood of redemption. It is the blood of reconciliation. 
It is the blood that washes our sins away. And it is through that blood that we have forgiveness. So as we partake, let's keep all of those things in our minds and on our hearts. We pray this in his most holy name. Amen. Though we usually take the collection about the same time as the Lord's Supper, it isn't connected to the Lord's Supper as the bread and the fruit of the vine is. But it is something that is obviously very, very, very important because Jesus uh, let us know that giving was an integral part of our lives. And so as Jesus sacrificed, maybe it, it is more like the Lord's Supper than we would like to think, that it is our chance to sacrifice. It is our chance to lay by and store and give back to the Lord that which is his. We realize that in order for the church to fulfill its mission, uh, just in a dollars and cents figure, we know that money is used so that, um, so that the work can be done. We can't minimize this. And I pray that each one of you uh, has thought of that and, and has figured how to lay by in store each week uh, as a part of, of uh, what we have that we can give back to the Lord. Let's pray together. Our God and Heavenly Father, we just thank you that uh, we have the opportunity to give. Uh, yes, I, I, I said it just in those terms, that we have the opportunity to give. We're, we're so grateful that we can. We're so grateful that you have blessed us. And we're so uh, open to knowing that what we have comes from you. I just pray, dear Heavenly Father, that as we give, we give with an open heart, that we give with a grateful heart, and that we understand that these monies will be used to further your work here on the earth. I pray this in his most holy name. Amen. And let's sing one more song before the lesson. And that song is number 185. <coughs> <clears throat> Jesus, thy name I love, all other names above. Jesus, my Lord, all thou art all to me. To please, I see nothing apart from thee, Jesus, my Lord, thou blessed Son of God. Has bought me with thy blood, Jesus, my Lord. How mighty is thy love, all of the Shall be. 
very happy then. Jesus, my Lord, then, then thy own face I see, then I shall like thee be. Thank you so much for singing with us. I know that the Lord was praised in song. It's why we do it. Uh, it's why we take this time to uh, just praise the Lord because he is worth that praise. If you were there this morning, uh, you heard that uh, the title of our lesson this evening is The Integrity of Worship. I think uh, I chose this topic because it fits very closely with our lesson uh, of the morning, and that was why I believe in the church. Because uh, the church, uh, the, the place, the church, is where we go on the first day of the week to worship the Lord. We worship him in song. Well, we worship him in getting into his word. We worship him in observing the Lord's Supper. We worship him in, in having someone break down the word of God and putting it in lesson form so it can be uh, hopefully more useful to each one of us. And so what I'd like to just talk about for just a, a few minutes this evening is integrity, the integrity of worship. In Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 8, these words are found. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is is his delight. I'm going to break that down a little bit as we get into this lesson this evening. Um, what do you think about worship? Uh, how important is worship to you? Do you realize that when we worship, we are revering the Lord? We are trying to reflect in our lives how much we love the Lord. And we are doing that, and that is culminating in our worshiping him and offering him that worship. And God must be honored by that worship, and he must be honored by those individuals that are worshiping. That means you who are listening this evening and me, just the same. I must honor the Lord in my worship also. And so, if our worship is to be honorable, if it is to honor the Lord, if there is to be integrity in our worship, it must be consistent with the lives that we lead. Did we get that? Because it is the, the heart of my lesson this evening. It must be consistent with the life that we lead. It must be consistent with the life that we lead when we're not there actively worshiping the Lord. Now, if we worship the Lord for an hour to two hours each Lord's day, that leaves the whole rest of the week to live our lives. And we must live our lives in such a way that we are fulfilling uh, God's will 
here on earth in our lives. It has to be consistent, right? If we are to honor God, it can't just be with our lips. It must be with our whole selves. There must be integrity to our worship, a unity, a consistency between our worship and our character. Our worship needs to reflect our character. That's why there are so many verses in the Bible that explain to us what kind of people we are to be. It's why we have that fruit of the Spirit. Those are the qualities that we are ought to engender. When Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount, and in specific, when he preached the Beatitudes, he said, blessed are. And that said that the folks that are doing it right are the ones that are blessed. Blessed are those that weep. Blessed are those that mourn. Right? And so again, our lives must be consistent with our worship. And our worship needs to reflect our character. If we worship and we disregard God in our hearts so that our daily lives are disobedient, then our worship is offensive to God. Let's go back to that proverb. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. Now, a similar proverb puts it this way. Proverbs 28 and verse 9. It says, One who turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer is an abomination. And you know what? I could cherry pick scripture after scripture after scripture that reflects these thoughts. These scriptures should literally arrest our attention. God isn't pleased by robotic worship. He isn't pleased by mechanical performance of acts of worship. I'm going to sing because, you know what, I come here and we sing and it's just what I'm going to do. The Lord wants our hearts in our songs. He cares 100% more about where our hearts are than how good our voices are. So that is an important part of our worship. These and other statements in the scripture should really, really grab our attention. Such acts are acceptable only when they are part of a life that is worshipfully obedient. I'd like us to take a look at Isaiah chapter 29 and verse 13. Now let's take a look at what Isaiah says and see if this sounds close to a scripture found in the New Testament. Isaiah 29, 13. It says, Then the Lord said, Because these people draw near with their words and honor me with their lip service, but they remove their hearts from me, and their reverence for me consists of tradition learned by rote. All right? Do you get that? It's not what the Lord wants. He doesn't want rote. He doesn't want mechanics. He doesn't want robotics. He wants people to honor him with their hearts. 
Does this eerily sound familiar to Matthew chapter 15, verse 8, where Jesus says, These people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me? The, the group of people that Jesus was at odds with very, very often during his ministry were, were the leadership of the church, the, the, the folks in the church that were uh, those preeminent people that uh, the regular ordinary Jews looked up to, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And what did he say about them? We well, said, you know what? You tithe, and you fast, and and it, it's just this amount of this, and and he even used the cumin, you know, and the you know, he even literally used the the things that were used in the in the the uh, in the giving, and he said, you know what? You do that. But you do that so that people can see you. You put your money in the plate so people can see you. You, you tithe. You fast. You even have a long face when you fast to show people that you're going through the pain of fasting. And what Jesus was getting at is, is you know what? It may hurt to fast, and that's okay. You should tithe, and that's okay. But make sure you do it all for the right reasons. Make sure you do it, and these things come from your heart. I'm not interested in mechanics. I'm not interested in robotics. I'm interested in what comes from your hearts. You know what? In, in the book of Judges, uh, for those of you who have done any study, uh, this was before there were kings, and so uh, Jesus allowed judges to come up uh, for the people when the people strayed. But almost before every judge that was installed or recognized, these are the words that we see. Then the sons of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. This is why they needed judges. The people knew what they were supposed to do. It wasn't that. They just decided to take their own path. And they thought it was okay. Obviously, it wasn't. And you know what? Maybe some of the inconsistency here lies in the fact that it's hard to see if we're doing that. If it's, it's hard for me to solo in on myself and in my life and my worship. But you know what? We're shocked when we see it in the lives of other people. How dare they worship when I know what they're doing outside of the church? Hmm easier to see in other people than it is to see in ourselves. In Isaiah, in Isaiah's day, uh, for example, the people of Judah had become morally degenerate. Social injustice was, uh, was rampant. Uh, God was being dishonored in, in almost every possible way. Yet, you know what? The people kept sacrificing. They kept coming to the temple. They kept offering their sacrifices, thinking, you know what? As long as I go through this, God will be pleased. It doesn't matter what I do on the outside. As long as I come to the temple and I put on that show of coming to the temple and sacrificing. And they supposed that that would be pleasing to God. And here, there's irony in this. Perhaps the real irony here is they, they perhaps even thought 
if they made these sacrifices, that the sacrifices would compensate for their disobedience and would make them, pardon the term, religious people. It would make them people that, that God was proud of. It would make them people that God would look at and say, man, these guys are really good. You know what? You can't fool God. It's hard enough to fool people who we can from time to time. You know, uh, Abraham Lincoln perhaps put it this way. You can fool some of the people some of the time and all the people some of the time. You can't fool all of the people all of the time. And to add something to that, you can't ever please, you can't ever fool God. God knows all. And so when the folks were coming into the temple and going through the mechanics, they were going through the robotic part of it. Their hearts weren't there, but they thought, if I just do the rest of this stuff in the temple, God will say, hey, this guy is doing it right. However, God made it clear, very, very clear, that his people would, that his people's worship would be rejected until they chose to repent of their iniquity. Now, when we go back to our personal conversion and our baptism, we are commanded not just to be baptized, but we are commanded to confess Jesus as the Son of God and repent of our former ways. Repenting is promising God, not just saying we're sorry, that we don't want to do those things anymore. We have to humble ourselves to repentance. Why? Because we are starting a new life. And the Jews back in the Old Testament days just didn't get it. They thought that their worship was okay as long as they went through the motions. And the same is true today. As Christians, after we come to the Lord, we can't go through the motions. Now we've put on the Lord. We've asked the Lord to come into our lives. We just can't do that anymore. Now, in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 12 and 13, and 15 and 16, I'm going to paraphrase some of this. It says, When you come to appear before me, who has required this from your hand? to trample my courts. Bring no more futile sacrifices. I cannot endure iniquity and the sacred meeting. Do you get that? You can't mix evil with good. It doesn't work. It's oil and water. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I do not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. It was kind of like the high priest going in to the Holy of Holies. He had to try to make himself as clean as he could before he went into the Holy Holies on that day. Thus, true worship requires a good deal more than ritual. It requires the true turning of a penitent heart toward its God. Now, just we need to make sure of the kind of lives that we lead. In Matthew chapter 23, verses 25 and 26, Jesus again came down hard on the Pharisees and he called them, he called the scribes and the Pharisees hypocrites and he said, for you clean the outside of the cup and of the dish, 
but inside they're full of robbery and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and of the dish, so that the outside of it may also become clean. Do you get what Jesus is saying? It is, it, it's what I've been saying for the past, past 15 minutes. You got to clean up inside before you can make that outward appearance. When we come to worship, we have to come with a true, penitent, open, loving heart. Otherwise, God's not interested. He's interested in integrity of worship. He's interested in character of worship. And he wants the people that worship him to worship in spirit and truth, to worship with character, and to worship with integrity. Now, in science, we use uh, laboratory activities very often to, to prove points. And the, the term sometimes that you, that's used and it's filtered down into the world is the acid test because very often acids are used for various chemical reactions. The acid test. What's, what's the acid test? Well, here it is. If worship does not change us, it has not been worship. If worship doesn't change us, it has not been worship. To stand before the Holy One is to change. Worship begins with holy expectancy. It ends in holy obedience. Did we get all of that? If worship doesn't change us, it hasn't been worship. That's the acid test. Right? If, if worship doesn't change us, we haven't worshipped. That's the lab test. And to stand before God the the God of eternity, because remember, that's where our goals are to live with the Lord forever. To stand before God is to change. And worship begins in holy expectancy and it ends in holy obedience. I hope that this message about the integrity of true worship has uh, maybe hit home with all of us. Maybe, it, you know, especially me, I thought long and hard when I put this lesson together about, you know, am I living the kind of life? Uh, am I uh, a person who is, is reflecting my worship in how I live my life. It's a wonderful acid test for us to, to, to look inward. Remember, uh, in uh, talking about the Lord's Supper, we're told to examine ourselves. We have to do some introspection to see whether we're living the life that the Lord wants us to live with, live. I said a moment ago, when we begin our walk with the Lord, when we decide as believers that we are going to uh, uh, obey the Lord into salvation, then we follow the biblical steps. And we've already mentioned of confessing Jesus as the Son of God. We, we mentioned repenting of our former ways and then being baptized for the mission of our sins. This is the beginning of our Christian lives. And in this, when we come to worship, worship will be more meaningful to us. There will be more integrity to that worship. And so that invitation is offered to you this evening. If you need to come to the Lord to begin your walk,
so that your worship will indeed become as meaningful as it ought to be, as it, it changes, helps change us into what we are supposed to be, then we offer that invitation to you. If you need to come to the Lord, get in touch with one of us this evening. We'll, we'll uh, come uh, to your place, meet you wherever uh, we can to get you started on your walk. If you need to come to the Lord, that invitation is open to you. I pray that the lesson has been viable, that it's been uplifting, that it's been edifying to each one of us. Let's pray together. Our God and Heavenly Father, help us, dear Heavenly Father, to live the kind of lives that uh, would make you proud of us, that, that let you know that uh, we're walking in the light and that uh, our worship will reflect that. When we come to worship, we will put our whole hearts into the worship, that we will worship you. And then when we leave that place, we will live that life uh, the rest of the week like we're still worshiping you because we are. Our life is a worship. And I pray that you would guide our lives Help us, dear Heavenly Father, that, that, that worship would change us and understand that uh, our worship begins with expectancy and it ends with obedience. Help us to keep those words close to us in our lives. I pray that you would be with us. Help us to look forward to the next time that we'll meet together. Uh, we pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Please be safe and may God bless you all.